again, uh, I'm Dan with the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington, and I'm very proud to be able to offer uh, to you all uh, another wonderful state-of-the-art class. I would not be able to do that without our partners and my uh, very supportive board. And this is where I am so proud to introduce someone who is not only very talented, someone who has been uh, a very strong supporter of the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington, but it actually is a brilliant person working for Hoffman Construction. So with no further ado, please let's give a warm welcome to Dale Stinning of the Hoffman we have until about 8 o'clock. We're getting a little bit of a late start, so we'll try and keep it on time. Uh, I wanted to do an overview of some terminology of BIM, uh, and, then, uh, and then talk about some things of setting up models in Navisworks, and working with models. And then about halfway through, we'll take a break for dinner, and then uh, talk a little bit about Revit, uh, and back in the Navisworks Clash Detection 4D, which is scheduling with Navisworks, uh, and 5D, which is cost estimating with Navisworks. And then uh, we have a little bit of uh, flex time at the end uh, in, in order to uh, uh, keep track of time and also just have an open discussion regarding uh, your questions or I'd really like to have time to talk to some of you about what it is you want to do with these tools in your career. So that would be really interesting to me and hopefully to you as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've uh, been working in AEC, Architecture, Engineering, and Construction for 41 years. Uh, my first half of my career was in Architecture and Engineering and uh, about 20 one years ago, I switched over to construction. Some call it the dark side of the industry. But actually, the light's pretty good once your eyes adjust. So these are some of the projects that uh, we've done fairly recently at Hoffman. Uh, we do a lot of work in semiconductor industry. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, called fabs, uh, chip plants uh, in uh, Oregon and Arizona, Israel, all over. Um, we're currently building a factory uh, for uh, Boeing up in Everett. Uh, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we're building a major expansion to the Beaverton campus for Nike. It's about six buildings currently. Uh, and I've chosen some, chosen some pictures of models because I want to reinforce the fact that we're doing full BIM coordination on all of these uh, projects. Uh, we just completed uh, a major store for Apple down in Portland, which we're real proud of. Uh, we do a lot of high-rise construction, so this is a project that's just finishing up also in Portland, Park Avenue West, uh, and we did full BIM coordination on this high-rise. We're also starting one in Seattle here uh, at uh, 8th and Blanchard, 41-story apartment tower. Uh, Molecular engineering underway, phase two at the University of Washington. Savory Hall, which is a project we completed a few years ago, but I like showing it off because this is a renovation project we did, and we did full laser scanning, uh, which is a segment of BIM, uh, to find out where all Points uh, using our laser scanner on these uh, on this on this building and integrated it in with the Revit model from the architect uh, so that we could overlay their as-built co concepts and get it all figured out just right. And then uh, many of you know we built Experience Music Project uh, with Frank Gehry. Uh, this was really the first exposure many of us had to 3D CAD and. Uh, uh, really is the sort of the cornerstone for, for BIM within my company. And from the Experience Music Project, we went down the street and built the Seattle Central Library. And those, both of those projects are uh, near and dear to my heart. Those two projects combined represent uh, close to 10 years in my career working on them. And to this day, I'm still really proud 
And I hope that all of you get a chance to work on really meaningful projects. Maybe, you know, it'll be different than these projects, but every project has a, a lot to it, and uh, especially projects where the public accesses the buildings later on, um, schools, libraries, hospitals. There's a lot of satisfaction in one's career when you can make a difference on projects that, that make a difference to people. And so what I want to do tonight is get you uh, a better understanding of BIM fundamentals. Obviously, it's a huge topic. We're not going to be able to cover everything tonight. Uh, but I wanted to give you some background on it so you have a little more comfort when you're talking to other people, when you're uh, looking at models, when you're working with them. Uh, it, it, I think of this a lot like learning how to drive a car. You can, you can read a book on traffic regulations. You can sit in the passenger seat and watch people drive a car. You can watch movies on it and training videos. But really, it's all background. In order to learn how to drive a car, you really need to drive the car and practice it. And what happens is that it goes into your muscle memory. I, I bet you, maybe some of you don't drive, but most of you do, I'm sure. And when you're driving, you're not really thinking about turning the wheel or touching the brake. It's all down in your subconscious because you've done it so much, it becomes second nature. And when you're learning software like the BIM software, it's a lot like learning how to drive when it's not second nature, when every little thing has to be thought through and, and learned. And so you gotta get through that phase, just like when you're learning how to drive a car, so that it becomes second nature for you. So when you're flying around in the model or you're touching things in the model with the mouse, you're, you're not having to use the front part of your brain, if you will. It's down in your subconscious, so you're freed up to think more lofty thoughts about what it is you're trying to do. Uh, and, and then, I think I said it in the beginning, but it's worth repeating, I really want to understand you all and what you want to do with this. And maybe uh, toward the end of the evening, we have some discussion time bracketed for, for that. So uh, also, I want to point out that I tried to put some little breaks in between, some little like five minute breaks here and there, so that as we move from one chapter to another, there's a little bit of time to clear your head. I, I guarantee you that uh, I'm going to fill your brains up because I know how it goes. Uh, the last thing I want is for you to be overwhelmed. I want you to have time to process it. So I would want you to ask questions. I want you to uh, be engaged. And if, if I'm going too fast or if something wants to be revisited, please raise your hand and ask the question. So, so what is BIM? So it's, you know, it's, it's an acronym for Building Information Modeling. And, those are kind of throwaway words, really. You know, it's about buildings, because it's, it's about our industry, AEC. Uh, and it's models, I'll go to the other side of it, models are, are very abstract. They could be most anything. Even, I even think of 2D drawings as models, because it's just a collection of information. To me, the most important part of this is information. If you think about all the things that we deal with on construction projects, you know, RFIs, uh, submittals, uh, specifications, lists of materials, lists of resources, it's all data. And now we have these really powerful tools for organizing this data in a central location. We don't have to have notebook after notebook of, of you know, a paper, you know, where you have to thumb through it all the time. It can all be embedded in here. So it's geometry, it's a relationship between elements, um, it's uh, the analysis of the materials, it's the quantification of them, you know, how many of them are, are there, how big are they, how much room do they take up. It's the manufacturer's information, like maintenance information, or, um, or uh, cut sheets on how to install something. And it's even life cycle information. We're, we're seeing there's another term that's going to be more and more common called FIM, F-I-M, which is uh, facility information model. So as we're building the building, we're using BIM, and then as they're operating the facility, uh, they're using it in a whole different way. And so the life cycle information is, is very important. Things like warranties, uh, you know, a, a, a depreciation schedules, you name it. And, and, and I can't reinforce enough how, how important it is that we, we consider the data that we're bringing into these models and not just the geometry. 
Uh, so you hear about 2D and 3D and every kind of D you can imagine. So 2D is basically X and Y. For example, this floor, you could, you could measure it out in one direction, let's call it X. You could measure it out in a second direction, let's call it Y. You pretty much captured the, the, um, the area of that floor with two dimensions. Uh, 3D files need a third dimension in order to create the volume, as you can imagine. Uh, and we tend to work with coordinates. We tend to work with X and Y uh, coordinates or X, Y, and Z coordinates in 3D. So those, are dis those create discre discrete points in that 3D environment that we can refer to. Now 4D uh, is adding time to the equation. So we take a 3D model and we add time, which is the same thing as saying we tie it to our schedules. So if we have a schedule that, that has a, a series of tasks and they're all related to each other and you say, okay, the first task is gonna start today, February 2nd, and you know how long each one's gonna take, you can calculate the, the start date and finish date of every one of those tasks. Now, if you take certain objects in the model, like say, pouring a foundation, take the foundation elements from the model and link them to the activity in the schedule for pouring the foundation, now you've associated them together, and we can show, and I'll show you some examples. We can put a time scale video together that shows the sequence of our, our, our schedule using the model. 5D is a 3D model that has cost associated with it. Now, that can be embedding the cost parameters like unit price into the model object, but more commonly is we're extracting quantities from our model and importing those into our uh, estimating environment. That's the more common way to do it, but you can do it either way. The, 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 the bottom line is we can do things like, uh, you know, figure out how many cubic yards of concrete are in our foundation and, and link that to our estimate where we would put our price per cubic yard in. And with like concrete, we're also interested in square footage on the top, so we have to finish the top of that footing. We're interested in uh, vertical areas because we have to buy the formwork that make up the, the edge forms. There's a, a lot of variables associated with something like concrete, you know, but it would be true for anything, painting, <coughs> drywall, uh, electrical conduit, you name it. We can, we can assign parameters to our 5D model and feed our costs through. <coughs> really powerful stuff. Uh, so, you know, I know this sounds really simple, but I really want to drive home that this is all just a lot of parts and pieces. So we have points. Points actually take up no physical space. They're these theoretical elements, so, but they do have a location, and so we need the X, Y, Z coordinate of the point to define it. Uh, lines are basically two points linked together in, in a straight line. And in order to uh, define a line in 2D, we need two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2. And then, of course, to define it in three dimensions, our points have three variables on them. Does that all make sense to people? Any questions? Good. So the, the drawings in a BIM environment, the drawings are, are produced from the model. And so uh, they're kind of like a report of what's in the model. Okay. And so you can do, if you're an estimator, you can do takeoffs from the drawings, mm -hmm. um, or you can do takeoffs from the model. And it's more like an and, uh, because there are certain things like carpet or um, paint finishes, like colors, that aren't usually in a model. They're usually just a key plan of finish types and things like that. So you would need to do those from the drawings. Things that are solid, like volumes of concrete, uh, uh, or things that are, you're wanting surface areas, like surface areas of drywall mm -hmm. or, or, or surface areas of wall assemblies, you can get from the model. Well, that would be tricky because if you download drawings from Builders Exchange, those, okay, those, those drawings are a report that comes from the model. Mm -hmm. And so you can't go backwards. You can't go from drawings to a model. You can only go from a model to drawings. So if you get a bunch of drawings from Builders Exchange, you would not have BIM. 
you would just have 2D drawings. And you would have to use the traditional approach to getting your quantities, you know, going with the wheels or measuring things with scales and things like that. So if we take two lines in a plane, crisscrossing, we have a surface. Uh, you know, it could be the edge of where the floor meets the wall in one direction and the edge where it meets in the other direction. That creates a surface. And surfaces don't have to be planar. In other words, they don't have to be in one plane. They can be curved. Like I showed you a picture of EMP. That's a pretty extreme example of a surface that's been curved. Um, so surfaces have two dimensions. They have a length and they have a width. Okay? Or if they're on a wall, they have a, a width and a height, let's say. But it's always two. Now objects, objects are like this computer mouse. Okay? It's a solid element. And this is really what makes BIM so powerful is that, that I can, if I model this mouse, it has all these different details on it. Now I, could, I can look at it from the top, I can look at it from the side, I can look at it from the bottom. I've only modeled it once, but I can get any number of drawings or views of that mouse out of this one thing. And then if I, if I make a change to it, like I decide I don't like this wheel design, I'm gonna do a different kind of wheel. I make that one change, and every one of my drawings is updated. I don't have to go and redraw the drawings. As I said before, the drawings are a report of what's in the model. So once I formulate that report, which is the drawing view, I don't have to touch that drawing anymore. So if you know the, 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 the management team says if we want to add another button or we want to change the wheel or we want to change the, anything on this, I just have to change it once in the model, all my drawings are updated. That, the, the technical term for that is parametric modeling. Parametric means para is many and metric is measure. So you get many measures out of one effort is what that means. And it's really changed everything. Because in the old days, if I do a, a plan view and an elevation and a section on my sheets, I would have to go revise every one of those drawings again, one at a time, in order to make that one little change. And I don't have to do that anymore, which is really a big deal. Um, and then I mentioned the information. So you could think of that as a form of intelligence. So these objects have become intelligent. When, when we were just doing drawings, like you're mentioning the, the Builders Exchange drawings, you can see all the lines and words and everything, but there's really not much you can do with it other than touch it with the scales and things. You couldn't search it very easily. You couldn't um, filter it. Um, it's just a piece of paper with lines on it. But with, with the BIM, we can come up with all kinds of ways to, uh, to witness the intelligence that are in here. Uh, it's often called metadata. Meta, like para, is a Latin term that means many. So many data, many pieces of information can come out of it. Um, so we can find out if it's made of wood or metal or glass. We can get the sizes of it or the ID numbers of it. We can link it to our schedule and our costs, as I mentioned. We can assign a resource to every object. So, like we do it all the time, like all of our concrete is assigned to our concrete sub and all of our drywalls are assigned to our drywall sub. I can filter the models and literally show a person only their work. Or maybe I have an electrician and a plumber and I'm meeting with them. I can just show the electrical and the plumbing together and I can show them where all their things inter interact. Or we can set it up for status, we can say, what are the things that we've signed subcontracts for? Or what are the things that have approved submittals? Or what are the things that are installed already versus the things that are not installed? What are the things that are delivered to the job site ready to install? You know, we can ask questions like, you know, if we link our schedule to this and our resource load to this, we can ask questions like, you know, show me all the objects in the model that are, that are scheduled to be installed in the next two weeks that don't have approved submittals. Really powerful ma management of this data. And, and it's not just a report that spits out, it's the model is now filtered and it shows us all the objects that meet that particular search criteria. No differently than Google, you know. Once you learn how to search on Google, you can imagine how powerful it is. Well, we all live that now. How would you get by without it, right? We can do the same thing in our models. So clashes, clashes are um, situations where two things are taking up the same physical space. Because we're dealing with virtual 
reality here, right? So there's no reason why a pipe and a conduit can't exist in our model in the same volume. Obviously, it wouldn't happen in this building. But we can find all the places where it will happen if we don't make a change, and we can, we can adjust for those. We can, we can assign those to a certain resource to remedy, or we can um, measure how much it is, and we can move things a certain distance to clear them up. Really powerful uh, tools. And these use the same kinds of search engines as, as your, your internet web searches. Uh, we can also do clearance clashes. So we can say, show me all the places where the uh, pipes are within two inches of the steel. Because maybe there's going to be fireproofing on that steel. Or maybe there's going to be insulation on the pipe and it's not in the model. I don't have to find places where they're physically touching. I can say within a certain distance of each other. So I can control it really well. So you may have heard IFC, issued for construction. So that would be a status that uh, the architect's drawings get when they've matured and are ready for construction or ready for us to buy materials off of them. And we have a, a corollary term, IFF, issued for fabrication, which is a lot like uh, an approved submittal, approved shop drawing. Uh, so a lot of times, and I'll talk about this a little more in, a little later in the evening, but a lot of times the design that we get is not completely accurate. Imagine that. Uh, there's some things that need to be coordinated. And so we will take the design as sort of a background or a, a, an intention, and then we'll perfect it. So uh, we, meaning the construction team, we're going to figure out every little bit about any building, you know, down to the clips and the hangers and everything. Anything that takes up physical space, we'll put in our models. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so we have to go in and perfect our models. And what that IFF means is that it's effectively perfected. It's, it is our plan of how we're going to build no differently than an approved shop drawing would be uh, on that side. And then uh, there's kind of a new, a new role in our industry, model coordinator. They, they didn't really exist before. And now we have a, it's a real specialty. Uh, we have, uh, at Hoffman, we have, there are 12 of us, including myself, so myself and 11 others, that work in our department, coordinating these models and working with our subs, working with our architects, working with our owners to get all these uh, models really, really well perfected. So, you know, we all know that term, measure twice, cut once. So we measure it in the model, <coughs> and then we measure it in the field, and then we cut it. Or we cut it in the shop and we measure it there first. So uh, one thing that happens is everybody is kind of working in a vacuum on many, many projects. And so, you know, the electrical engineer, the architect, the structural engineer, and then, you know, our subcontractors are all working off in their own environments. We have to come up with a coordinate system that, that we all can agree on for where all these CAD files are going to land. Because if they don't land in the same XYZ coordinate system, we can't clash to get detect, we can't really see the relationship of, let's say, the plumbing file and the electrical file. We have to be in the same place. And so um, what that means is that uh, we have to decide where this origin is. This, you know, this is called a Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, it's been around for centuries. And it's, there's an X and a Y, and typically when you're looking at it, the horizontal or left right is the X, and the up and down is the Y, and the one coming out of the page representing elevation is the Z, okay? And that's just the default. And we like putting our building uh, here rather than here. And the reason for that is that uh, this is positive x, and this is negative x, this is positive y, and this is negative y. And what that does is it puts everything in the positive quadrant. Everything is a positive number. If we put it in the middle here, we'd have negative, negative, positive, negative, negative, positive. We'd have all kinds of weird numbers, and when we're doing the subtractions and the, and the logistics, it gets confusing. So we like to put our building sort of north and east, of, of the zero point, and then uh, because 
buildings are on site. This campus is a perfect example. You know, there's a half dozen or so buildings around these parking lots, and they're all kind of on different skews. And, you know, but when you look at the drawing, north is almost always up on the page, and it kind of fits to the borderline, and it's all squared up. So the architects work in this axis. So there's this axis here, x, y, and it's, it's kind of related to their building. And you could think of this as the border around the drawing. But the building itself is not north on the site most of the time. Or sometimes it's off by just one degree or something, you know, because we're inheriting existing conditions. So we end up with all these coordinate systems. And it's absolutely critical that, especially early in the project, people think this through and, um, and figure it out. Now, most of you, if you're working with models and you're getting a model, let's say, from an architect or from a contractor or whomever, a lot of that's going to be thought through already hopefully, but I wanted you to kind of understand how all these grid systems work together because it's, it's really important to understand the context. So if someone gives you a file and you open it up and, it's, and you look at, you know, how they have the grids, grid 1 through 10 and A through E or whatever, you look at a lot of times grid 1A, that intersection, will be at 0, 0, 0, you know, uh, or 0, 0 and elevation 100 or something like that. Well, that means that your building is going to come in right here. You have to know what these what these transform coordinates are so that you can move it to land it where it wants to go. So it's it's really kind of complicated. We're not going to go into that in great detail. I just wanted to get you familiar with it. So there's different kinds of software. Uh, most of you, I think, have heard of have heard of Revit. Uh, it's a it's a pretty major software platform by Autodesk. And uh, you'll, you'll, if you see a file that has an RBT extension, that's a Revit file. And uh, it's, I, I mentioned the parametric. So one model produces many drawings. So parametric, many measurements. Uh, it's the most widely used software in the design profession, in North, especially in North America. Uh, most architects and many, many engineers are using Revit. Uh, and uh, every year, Autodesk puts out a new flavor of Revit. So we're on Revit 2016 now. And uh, you know they're in it for the money, right? So they've figured out how to make it not backwardly compatible. So if, if you're working with Revit 2015 or Revit 2014, and someone hands you a thumb drive with a file on it that was built in 2016, or some number after yours, you will not be able to open it. They want you to keep buying in, you know, they want you to keep paying the money to keep updating your software to the latest file. So what happens is project teams uh, decide at the beginning of a project what version they're going to use, and they typically stick to, a, stick to that going forward. Now, if you have a later version of the software, you will be able to open it, older ones, no problem. Don't worry about that. It's just that if you, you know how it is, we all get software and then we maybe go four or five years without updating it. You won't be able to do that with the Autodesk products, unfortunately. So you, so you create a 3D drawing by using the software? You could what, sorry? You, uh, you could create 3D model by yes. using the software? Yeah, so Revit is specifically built for creating 3D models for and, and for creating the drawings that come from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's AutoCAD, which is also by Autodesk. Uh, and many of you have heard of AutoCAD, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, probably some of you have used it or do use it. Uh, and it's, it's another, uh, it's not a parametric tool. I mean, you can work in 3D, but it doesn't have the same parametric tools that, that Revit does. Uh, so, and it's not really good at managing data either. I mean, you can use layers and things, but really it's more about making drawings. So I, I don't really consider AutoCAD to be a BIM platform as much because there's because of the I. This I in BIM is information. And with AutoCAD, it's not as powerful. Um, but you'll find like when you when you have to do CAD compliance for say your customer, like a, a client, if they give you their CAD standards, it's almost always built around AutoCAD. So it's all their layers, they want their layers to have certain colors and things like that. Very few 
corporate customers actually have a true BIM standard, like how to get 3D models to them. So that's an area that our industry really needs to do some work on. And then there's Autodesk Civil 3D, which if you do site utilities, that's what most uh, civil engineers work in. And then Navisworks is the software that, that my people use the most. Um, and it doesn't, it's not a, a tool for building models. It doesn't build models. What it does is it views them. It lets you bring in the models from other sources, put them all in that coordinate system I showed you, and stack them all up and, and see them all together. Um, and that's what we'll have running on these three computers over here when we get to that point. Uh, and there's three kinds of Navisworks. There's Navisworks Freedom, which is what we're running here, which is a free viewer. Then there's Navisworks uh, Simulate and Navisworks Manage. And Simulate and Manage are more expensive, are expensive software and they're very similar to each other. We use Manage, which is the top one, because it has the clash detective t tools and all the major tools. And I'll show you uh, what that looks like too. And so I mentioned that Autodesk publishes major updates each year. Earlier versions won't open, and current files, but later versions will open earlier ones. And I'm just driving that home again because you're going to run into it a lot. If you're not, like if you work for some company that is willing to spend on every year, it's not a problem. But if you're like most of us and you have an older version, you just have to be aware of it and, and work through that. And how much does that software cost? The Navisworx Manage is about $8,800 per seat. There's lots of ways you can buy it. You can get a network license that multiple people can use one at a time. But yeah, a single, single seat is about $8,800. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of models. You get existing condition models, like if somebody gives you their old as-builts. Uh, there's design models. Uh, and design models go through a big progression uh, from schematic design through design development through contract documents and during construction administration. So those are the four big phases that designers work in. And as you go from one to the next, their models get more and more interesting. At the beginning, they're very crude. They're just kind of fleshing out the, the details of the building. but. By the time they're done is when all the keynotes and requirements and everything are embedded in there. Um, so you, if you're working with a design model like as an estimator, you kind of have to understand where it's at in its development in order to be able to be accurate. And then construction models, I mentioned IFF, the issues for fabrication. So before that point, we call it work in progress models, so they're just changing all the time. And then we get to the IFF milestone, which is like an approved shop drawing. And then post IFF uh, is when we're in construction and we're installing and maybe some things change during that time and we have to go back and revise our models then. So those are the stages. Yes, sir. So we're, we're, we're plugged in with the design team at some point in their process. Um, usually when, when our construction group gets involved, it's during the DD, kind of halfway through. And so we'll work, we'll work with them from then on. And so we'll get their models. Usually we get their models every week. And we keep refreshing everything. And then when we're coordinating our routing, we're doing uh, our work in progress models. And then we get them ready for approval when they become IFF. And then that's what we build. And then um, there's this term that you may not be familiar with called a federated model. And what that is, is a combined collection of all the best resource, like all the best design content and all the best construction content and all the best existing conditions content, all compiled together in a, in a federation of information so that we're able to make the best decisions possible. And then at the end, when we're all done, it becomes an as-built, and the whole thing starts over because the as-built is a record of what we built, and then maybe you know, one or two decades later, the owner wants to make a change, and they use our model as their as-built to start the whole thing off again. So it's a, it's a continuum of information. And we all know, 
you know, whether it's a house or a commercial building or what, you know, when to move in, you don't stop tinkering with it. You know, people make changes and things all the time. And so it's really important to keep the model accurate. That's what I call model atrophy, is when you don't keep the model current, it starts to decay in its, in its value because it doesn't reflect what's out in the field anymore. Um, I'm going to skip through these. Uh, one thing, though, I do want to drive home on this is, is, is the way the files are named. It's not, uh, not impossible to imagine a couple hundred files in the federated model from all different sources. And if the files are named rather randomly, like file 001 or Bob's file or something like that, it's really not good. So uh, we, we, you can't read this, unfortunately, because of the resolution, but we build these really um, detailed dictionaries that show us how all the files are named. They're, they're sorry, I know you can't see this, but the file names are in these special uh, data fields, and each one, so it goes campus, and then building, then level, then sector, then discipline, then author, then model type, and the file extension. So we kind of break it from big to little, and, and everywhere along there, um, at first it looks really random, like, you know, if there's a bunch of penguins on a rookery, they all look the same, but, but the mom penguin can go in and find their baby every time, you know, because they see the pattern. And the idea of this is to create the pattern so that when you're looking at these file names, you're focusing in on just the discipline or just the author or just the level, and you're able to work with these files really, really effectively. Uh, so uh, with all that having been said, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about Navisworks. It's a, it's a really good software, and, and as I mentioned, unfortunately we weren't able to get it on your screens, but we have it on two computers over here, and we're gonna be working with you guys to show you, show you that in a few minutes here. So what I have on those computers is, this is the Sound Transit uh, Roosevelt Station model. It's, a, it's an early, simpler model, but I thought that would be a good one for teaching. And, uh, but I wanna, I wanna show you some things about the way the software is organized. So uh, here I'll, uh, I'll drag, come on, there we go. I'll drag, I'll drag it up there. Cool. So the thing across the top is called a ribbon. And there's a home ribbon that, that lets you do things like um, uh, select things, so I, I can just go in and click on it, and I've selected it. So you can see it turned blue. Uh, I, can, I can select everything, or I can select nothing. So I can do some things with that. Um, and then there's this selection tree. And this is a really important uh, tool. Because what this does is, is it gives me access to all the detail. Um, so if I want to select the south entry level, I can select it off this tree. And you can see I turned all this part blue. So it's a really powerful way to get to the information. Uh, the visibility is another really important one. So if I don't want to, uh, let me zoom in on that, that blue part. Maybe I don't want to look at it right now. Uh, in fact, I'm going to turn off the grid too. Um, so maybe I don't want to look at that. Well, I can hide it. So right here is my hide button. I can click on that and hide it. So now I can see what's behind it. Okay. Um, I'm going to do that one more time. Okay. So uh, somebody says, "Hey, uh, I like." i have done looking at the south entry level. Could you hide it for me? I can click on it here in the selection tree because uh, it's nicely grouped there. And then I can hide it just by clicking on hide, okay? Now this is really valuable. Like if you're doing a takeoff, uh, you're counting things, you can hide them as you count them. So you just keep reducing the, the view and you can see what hasn't been counted. It's a really, you know, in the old, you know, you have to do the color, you know, when you do your takeoffs. You don't have to do that with this. You can just 
take it off and hide it. And then when you're when nothing's left, you're done. You know, it's that simple. Um, I can um, unhide all. And you might wonder what the heck is that? What's going on is there's a, a point cloud file that's in this model. We went out and laser scanned everything and in the Freedom Viewer, I didn't know this until I got it loaded on these computers, but it doesn't come through very well. And that's this RCP, it's an Autodesk recap file. And so I can click on it and I can hide it and get it out of there for us. The other thing that's in this model is we did a SketchUp, um, here I'm gonna hide this one too. We did a SketchUp model, we do this a lot, that is just the terrain of the site and in this case, you may know this, uh, there's a tunnel contractor that's already in this hole, making the, the tunnel boring uh, between one station and another. So they're using this site, and this, this is the shoring and the elevators uh, that get down into that tunnel right now. So we made a SketchUp model for all that stuff, just as a background, and then um, this uh, NWC file is the is from the Revit file that we got from the design team. So there's three three components to this. There's the um, the recap file, which is the point cloud, the SketchUp model, which is the site logistics, and then the building. And then I can open up this building, and I can you know if I want to find elevator one. Now another cool trick here is called hide unselected, and it's kind of a couple of weird words to put together, but what it means is hide everything except for what has been selected. Okay, so you can either hide what you do select or hide everything else. So if I click on elevator one and then I hit hide unselected, I can just find elevator one. And there it is, that wasn't very dramatic, I know, but um, uh, maybe North End Platform might be more interested. interesting. Hide unselected, there we go. So that's everything that's in the North End platform. So you know maybe you organize your estimate around these, these topics and you take them one at a time and you take them off and hide them. That's a good way to work your way through. Because you know how it is, you know, if you forget, if you forget stuff, you have to go back and start over and that's no good. So I got everything open now and I'm just, I'm just cruising around in the model uh, let me get rid of that um, recap file. And here you can see the station. I mean, you may have seen some renderings or, you know, some visualizations. I know Dan put this together. Um, I think we'll be, we'll be looking at this later. But, you know, all these pictures you see of the building, those all come from this Revit model. These are just, these have just been rendered. I, I showed you earlier how you can put materials in there like wood and concrete and glass. Those are all in here and then when you put it on render, it makes them photorealistic and it makes, you know, this, maybe not so much all the trees and everything, they add that with maybe Photoshop, but all the, I'll give you a better one, like this one. This was made from the model you see on the screen. It's just, this hasn't been rendered and this has. That shows you how powerful it is, right? You can look at it lots of different ways. Um, so, um, so that's that's the home ribbon. Let me uh, let me advance this. Can, can you um, you tell us how to use that navigation? Uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be getting to that in a minute. Yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe it'd be easiest just to work off this. So that's the home ribbon, and then the viewpoint ribbon uh, is is it lets me kind of na manage how everything looks. So I mentioned the rendering thing. This is this is where I would I would create the rendering. I can section my view um, and just show you like one floor only, or just from grids C to D. Uh, I can put uh, realism in so I can turn on collision. As I'm walking along in the model or flying along, I'm, right now I'm able to fly right through walls 
Like I'm going right through everything, right? Um, nothing's stopping me. But if I turn on collision um, and I go along, I oh it didn't work. How did I? I'm like stronger than I thought. Or gravity. I can't. I, huh? It's not working. Well, I don't know why that didn't work. It usually works. Anyway, I can, I can, like, gravity and collision are really good. You can actually walk downstairs with it. It's kind of cool, uh, but for some reason it's not working. Uh, if I can look at review. In, in Freedom, there aren't very many tools, but in review I can measure. So I can measure from, um, from this column up to that, to that point, for example. And when you do it, because I picked a point, I went on a diagonal, but it tells me my X, Y, Z. I haven't changed my setting, but I'll show you how to do that. Because can you set the speed on the gravity? Not the speed on the gravity, but you can set the speed on the walk tool. What the gravity does is it just keeps you from. Um, it makes you go to the bottom. So if I'm going downstairs, it will automatically drop me down as I go. Um, and collision keeps me from going through solid objects. Um, so I can I can do my measurements there. Um, the animation with Freedom, you just get to play animations. You can't create animations, but animations are a series of views you create, and they kind of thread together. And you can pre preload the walk through the building. Um, my view command is really kind of a big place. So um, there's all these different kinds of windows. Uh, that let me do all kinds of things and this is where I can turn them on and turn them off activate them uh, if you ever uh, if you ever do full screen I don't know the projectors messing with it um, full screen gets rid of all the ribbon and everything and just makes the whole thing that way uh, so and then output on Freedom, it's not very powerful. Basically, I can just print. I don't know why you would print a model, but it's not like 3D print, it's like 2D print. So that's a little strange. Uh, and then item tools, let me work with those. Those you won't be using there very much. The ones you're gonna be using the most are this select tool, which lets you uh, go, like right, right now I'm in walk mode, but I, so I can't select anything. When I wanna select something, I go up and select and now I can select, but I can't walk. So I can come over here to the walk tool, and now I can walk around again. And we'll go over that as soon as we get you guys on these computers. So that's kind of a basic overview. And like I said, it's, it's kind of like I just talked to you about how to drive a car, but you don't know how to drive a car because you haven't driven it, okay? So you gotta learn this, um, and uh, I was hoping we could all be going through all these while I was talking, but maybe, can rotate, so if you're ready, we're going to take a break. Yeah, why don't we take a break and we'll make sure everything's working right, and then sure. after dinner we can uh, we can get through some navigation because I know that's what you guys really want to start doing. And you have some other tools like object over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if I went over them all now, oh. you'd probably forget them as soon as the food started going in. So uh, <laughs> let's do this maybe after we'll go through all these. I'm going to explain all these to you guys and then show you which ones you really ought to learn. Set current view as home, and that'll be my home view from then on, okay, so you can customize it that way. Uh, but what I really wanted to show you is <coughs> the rest of these tools here. Uh, these are your navigation tools. Uh, I'll, I'll show you this one real quick. It's, it's this, um, and this is true with all Autodesk software too, is you can have this thing out on your screen and it gives you your zoom, your orbit, uh, your center walk, all those. I kind of don't like this. You, you might find you like it, and so you should, you should practice on it when you get freedom on your machine, but I, I, I don't think it's necessary, personally. So these are the tools that you really should be thinking about. So this is pan, so I click on pan, and now I'm, what I'm doing is I'm using the left mouse button and I'm just holding it down and I'm able to move the whole model 
back and forth, okay? Now, in this particular instance, I'm, if you think of yourself, you know, sitting, you know, stationary, you're staying stationary and you have to remove the entire world around you, okay? You're stationary, you remove the world, which is, you know, for some people, that's, that's a really good way to do it. And, and it's like SketchUp works that way. If you've ever used SketchUp, you work that way. So you'll play with that one. This is the next one down is your zoom one. And so if you want to get in on an area, you just zoom to that window. Click on it. Zoom to a window. And the smaller the window you make, the more zoom you're doing. If you if you uh, undo that, if you click on it and do a really big window, it's not going to move very much. Okay. If you do a, a tiny window, it's going to move a lot. Okay. Kind of makes sense, right? It's taking that window that you make and making it bigger. It's whatever whatever rectangle you make, it's going to zoom it out evenly until it hits either top and bottom or left and right, depending on the rectangle you make. So when you zoom, zoom in, it goes through the building too? Um, well, not really, not with that tool. Let me, let me see, it might. Uh, let me get inside the building and then let's see what happens. So here I am inside the building. Now I'm going to use that tool and maybe go over here. So it doesn't really go through because it's going to stop probably before that most of the time. But but it, it would if you got the zoom right to where it, it would fill up because you're going in closer. So I guess yes is the easy answer, but it is. Yeah, I guess it does go in. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I'll go back to my home view. The next tool is orbit. Now, orbit is kind of like pan in that your body is stationary. Um, but in this case, you're going to be spinning it around. So if I click on orbit now, and you'll notice the mouse changes. It, it turns into that symbol. Now, I'm going to be able to spin the model around. Now, if I have selected something, and then I choose orbit. I'm gonna, you see how it put that pivot point in there? It's gonna orbit around that pivot point because I selected that. So I, to do that, I go to my home, <coughs> select, and then maybe this roof, and then orbit around the roof. Maybe I would zoom in on that roof, and then orbit around it. See how that pivot point is always kind of showing up? So that could be a pretty handy tool to use, that, that orbit one. Now, I mentioned I, I went to some trouble to differentiate between your body moving versus the model moving. And the ones we've looked at so far, the pan, the zoom, and the orbit, we're moving the model. Now, these two, this is look around and this is walk. Now, the model's going to stay put, and we're going to move. Our point of view is going to move. So it's, it's probably better to, uh, um, I'm cheating. I'll go through that, what I did in a minute, but bear with me. Uh, maybe you're in here, OK? Maybe you're pretending you're a passenger waiting for a train, OK? And you want to look around. So just use the look around tool. Now you'll notice um, it's kind of all about where I am. <coughs> I'm looking around just like I was standing in there, okay? Um, and then there's the walk tool, which is these, this feet here, walk tool. I click on that, and now I'm really moving around. The model is, is kind of stationary, and I'm the one that's moving, okay? So uh, the walk tool is actually, I think, the best tool. Uh, and I'm going to show you why. It's not just moving around horizontally. Uh, with the walk tool, you, you can really do all of the things I showed you before. It's, it's really the only tool I use. I don't use the other ones. Uh, so I, I used a driving analogy earlier. I'm going to use another driving analogy. Uh, when you're on the walk tool, the left mouse button is kind of like a gas pedal. Um, you can go around, you know, go forward, okay? 
but it's also like a steering wheel because if I, if I push the button down and I push forward, I'm going to go forward. If I pull the mouse back, I'm going to go backward. The more I pull it, the faster I go. So you can get a touch. You'll develop a nice touch. So, um, so I can go really slow. And all I'm doing is just pushing the mouse just a little bit forward. Or I can go fast. All controlled just by a little bit of subtle pressure on the mouse, okay? As soon as I let go of the button, I stop, okay? Please do the left click. Left click on the mouse, yes. Push it down and then push the mouse forward. Now, if I push down the mouse and slide the mouse, push down the button, the left button, and slide the mouse, I can, I can turn. So I showed you that look around tool. I'm doing the same thing, but I'm using the walk tool to do it. So I don't have to switch, okay? One thing you're going to find um, if you do a lot of work with these models is your hand can get tired. Especially if you kind of clench the mouse really hard, if you're the kind of person that really grabs it, and you're in the food industry, it's like knife work. I'm our, I'm our herbal specialist. Yeah. I'm not a specialist for our There you go. So, you know, some of my people have a lot of problem with their forearm if they, if they don't use the mouse correctly. And all these um, switching tools is just more strokes of the finger on the mouse. And it's more, also your eyes can get fatigued. So it's more having to look at things. So if you learn that walk tool really well, you, you won't ever have to look over here at this menu. In fact, you can just turn it off. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to say, again, multiple button mouse, are those just programmable in your multi button mouse? They are, okay. yeah. Uh, so, okay, so, so far I've been talking about steering and going forward and backwards, all with the left mouse button. And, and it's, but that's all <coughs> in a horizontal plane, okay? And so you think, how do I move in a vertical plane? Okay? The vertical plane is with the scroll wheel. This is a three button mouse, the middle is a scroll wheel, but it's also a button. Okay, so uh, sort of the horizontal version of look around is, is pivoting the mouse left and right with a left button. The vertical version of looking around is rolling the scroll wheel. So if I roll the scroll wheel up or toward me, I'm basically pivoting my head on my shoulders, okay, up and down. Now, if I, if I hold down the scroll wheel as a button, and I move forward, it's like I'm in an elevator. Okay, if I move backward toward me, then I'm in an elevator. So that's how I move up and down, okay? So with just two buttons and the walk tool, I'm able to do everything. And then the, I started by showing you the pan tool, which is this hand, okay? Which lets me, let's say, move left and right. If I use the walk tool, and I hold down the middle scroll wheel, and slide my mouse to the left, it's just like pan. Okay? So I'm doing a lot of different things with the walk tool. And I don't really need to go to these other ones if I learn that one. So if you were to really want to learn just one of these, learn the walk tool. Just it's kinda like, you know, when you were fifteen and a half and your your dad or whatever took you out to driver's ed and wasn't that big shopping center parking lot on a Sunday or whatever, you just got to drive around and not hit anything, that's what you should do. You should just drive around, don't worry about it. Of course, even if you hit something, it doesn't even hurt. Can you zoom with the walk tool? Um, well, zoom is basically just getting closer to something. So if I want to zoom in on this wall down here, I can just go up there and I went a little too fast, but um, if, you, if I go back to my home button, and I just want to be get it in tighter. I can I can zoom in. It's kind of a two-step thing, though. I have to go horizontal and then vertical. So it it isn't a real good zoom tool. So you might find if you want to zoom in that that you would use the zoom tool because oops, um, because then you can just do that and zoom right in. It does work better to zoom with the zoom tool. Because walk, you have to go over and then down. Is there a way that you can zoom by just maybe having a hold that control and scroll? Or... No, it doesn't work that way. But there is there is one thing that you can do uh, with the walk tool that's pretty it's pretty good. Uh, is uh, 
let's say I'm going along and I want to go faster, like I'm cruising along here, I can hold down the shift button and, I, and it doubles the speed. Mm -hmm. And that's really good if you're looking at clashes and things. So you've got things over here and over here. If you're looking at one, then you start over to the next one, just hold down shift and you go faster and then let go of shift right before you get there and it slows you right back down again. It's kind of like a worm, you know, a hyperdrive or something on a starship. Which I know a lot about. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's what you did before your design. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, and again, I I wish that we could have you all in front of the computer. You could all be driving around and getting into trouble. But do you want to let some people <laughs> yeah, play? Yeah. We're switching around. But those folks in the back row can move to the front row, and we can definitely uh, go uh, brave enough to to give it a try. Any questions? Anybody who wants to. Yeah. Any, any mouse, I mean this is just a, any, any mouse, it has to be a scroll wheel mouse, don't, don't bother with one that isn't, it really does make a difference in the scroll wheel, because that's the way it's programmed to use. Right click has nothing to do with Right click has nothing to do with navigation, uh, but right click does, is gives you some um, context sensitive menus. So, uh, so if I'm coming in here and um, I want to see what's on the other side of that louver, okay? I can come up here to my select, I can click on the louver, I can right click and I can hide it, okay? Like that. Uh, I could have used this hide, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but I, the right click sometimes is faster, yeah. When you hide it, you see them? Yeah, it just disappears. Um, so you, you, you might, if you've been kind of following along, you might say, well, how did I get from select tool to walk tool without going up to the menu? Yeah. yeah. I've got a question about that. 4D, 5D stuff we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Are, you, are you able to find out what material we use them in? Yeah. From yeah. This? Yeah. Let me sh let me talk about that in just a minute, okay? But I'll, I'll, I will get back to that. That's a really good question. So uh, I don't. I, you guys. I, mean, I mentioned at the beginning that your brains might fill up because that's what happens. There's just a lot, right? So I don't want to overload you. So there's there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that you could learn, but I don't want to even expose you to them right now because I don't want you to forget about something else that I want you to remember. But you're going to find that, that the things that you're going to do a lot when you're just walking around in these models is you're going to be selecting things, you're going to be hiding them, and then you're going to be coming down here to the walk tool, and then you're going to walk around some more, okay? That's, that's really the bread and butter of moving around in these models. So, yeah. Instead of hiding things, can you turn it into a transparency? You can. Um, uh, uh, I can select these two. I can override. Yes, uh, I don't want to go away completely. I just want to see through them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I was just curious if you could. I can reset the. I can. Units and transform. No. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not as used to. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 it's weird. I, I didn't realize it before. On on manage, I can um, my right click. This lets me override. It says override the appearance, but this one doesn't let me do it. There must be a way to do it um, in the review tab. Anyway, yeah, there is a way to do it. But I'm used to right clicking and seeing it override. And um, How are the models uh, created? How are models created? Uh, well, most of these models are built in Revit, uh, and so uh, there's all kinds of tools in Revit. We don't have time tonight to talk about Revit very much, but you know you can build floor levels and then put slabs in and then put walls in and just keep. keep it's just got this huge library of objects, and you're dragging them in and giving them the numbers so that they're locked down in the right place. And then, um, and then what we do is we we export the 
um, the Revit content out to a Navisworks file called a Navisworks cache file, NWC. And that's when we bring in Navisworks. And it's a lightweight, <coughs> clean model that we can work with. We can bring all the important things in that we want. And there was a question about looking at properties. Uh, there's a properties um, box for window. And every time you look at this, it's going to look a little different. But I'm selecting on, uh, I'm selecting on this diagonal brace here, this blue brace. And I can look at properties, and uh, I can see all kinds of stuff about it. I can see that it's a, it's a 5 by 5 by 5 sixteens uh, tube steel. HSS is hollow structural shape. Uh, I can see it's part of the structural framing system. Um, uh, it's probably a Revit family there of steel cross members, cross bracing. Okay. I can look at uh, each time you look at this, it's going to uh, give you different results. Um, but primarily, it was, it was this item tab that gave me the most information right there. So I'm, I'm able to see some things like that. Um, uh, if I if I grab this steel cross bracing text string, I can do things like like find items, and I can say it's an item um, which names contains, and then I can just type that in uh, underscore s t l space cross. But that's good enough. And I want to make sure I don't match case because I didn't bother with the case. Oops, I lost that. <coughs> and then I can find all. Oh, you know what? I'm doing it wrong. I got two models going on wrong for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tool in here and I can search criteria and I would have been able to find all the examples of that cross brace. Sorry that didn't work. It must be very I'm not used to these tiny little screens. I'm used to my big double monitor card. So with that with that feature is would you be able to, to transform that metadata that you have <coughs> to automate the quantity you know quantity tabs or quantity takeoff? Yes. Yes. Now you can't do quantity takeoff with freedom. You can do it with uh, manage. In fact, I have I have a model here in manage that um, that I'll show you. Um, so this is actually the Boeing Triple uh, Seven X factory. It's pretty pretty amazing. Nothing nothing against Sound Transit. Those are cool buildings too. But um, uh, this is a really this is a million square foot new factory we're building in here. Of a pain field, I and mean, this thing is ginormous. That's a technical term, by the way. Um, and so, so here, what I've been, what I've been able to do is, is um, you know, do all these search sets. So um, I can hide unselected, and that's all the cable tray in the, in the model. So really powerful. When you build all these sets, these are all search sets. And once you build them all, using, you know, I showed you that cross brace little stream, text stream from that Revit model. So I'm able to create these search sets. I'm, you know, find all my clearances and my ceilings and my floors and everything. And I'm able to really drill in and manage the information that's in this model. And there, there's literally millions of items in this model, but I'm able to narrow it down. Can you extract that into a pivot table? Or... Uh, yeah, if I use the quantification workbook here. Um, now, I haven't set up quantification in this model, so I would have to go through this setup process. But this is where I can, I can take those, I can take table tray, and I can set it up with a cost code, 
and I can say find all the things that are in this search set called table tray and dump them into that cost code. And, it'll, it'll, and I can, then I can do formulas, so I might be looking for volume or I want to know how much wire could be in there or I'm looking for lineal footage. And I might, I might have to break it down into different types of tray. So maybe a 12 inch tray and an 18 inch tray. But I can, I can build really nuanced search sets and get all that going. Uh, another way to select things, uh, I'll get back into the model you guys are used to looking at. And Dale, before you go on, yes. um, for like a mechanical contractor, and uh -huh. you know, those folks that are involved in energy efficiency, Yes. Are, is there opportunities to develop algorithms or formulas that if you change the system from a chill beam system to a radio, you know, whatever the situation, are there ways to more efficiently make those kind of modifications so you can, in fact, you know, provide maybe, hey, this would be the difference in schedule, yeah. this would be the difference in cost. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that in NavSource because okay. NavSource doesn't create any of this stuff. It just views it and, and, and filters it. But if you were in Revit and you had a Revit family called the Chill Beam and you wanted to change those out to, or you maybe a better example is a light fixture, you have this kind of light fixture uh, in the Revit family, you want to switch out on, on level one of the building, you want to switch out that fixture to another type. That's where that parametric model comes in, is that you can just make that change in one little place and it populates all those fixtures everywhere. Really powerful. So what what are you doing in the Revit uh, architecture? Revit architecture? Mm -hmm. We use it a lot because there's a lot of things that aren't modeled, like ceiling grid. Architects don't usually model ceiling grid; they just draw little lines, and uh, and they and they a lot of times don't get it just right. And we need the grid in just the right spot so that all the sprinkler heads, like maybe it's one of those jobs where the sprinkler heads need to be perfectly centered on the tile. So we need to know where the ceiling grid is, um, but we have to put the sprinkler head in before the ceiling grid shows up sometimes. So we need to know exactly where that grid's going to go, and then so the center line between grids is the center line of tile. We need to be able to lay all that out. So we do a lot of modeling ourselves that nobody else would do. We model all of our site utilities ourselves too. So we do a lot. Yeah. So being a former ceiling mechanic, acoustical mechanic. Like the linear footage, if I go into, uh, you know, one of the programs, I can get all the linear footage for wall to wall angle on all the on the whole job. You could, you could indeed. So I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you what that looks like. So here I'm gonna um, untie it all. So I'm getting back to let me close this, and and I've got a, a I've got a ceiling grid search set. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I click on that. And then I do uh, hide unselected, which is this one right here. So I'm going to hide everything that I haven't selected. Right? By clicking that search set, I selected all the grid in the building. Now I'm going to hide everything else. And I actually have two kinds of grid. I have a grid that is these these uh, acoustical wall acoustical panels. Wall. Well, they're they're really relight frames. They were modeled in the same Revit family as the ceiling grid. So uh, um, I would have to ignore those or filter them out, but there's all my ceiling grid. And if I had my quantification workbook uh, all working, and I could I could tie all that in, and I could would calculate where I want my uh, seismic uh, layout for seismic posts. It would not. This is only 2016. That would be 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. <laughs> Maybe you need to design that program. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned the hydrology and uh, how this might be used with erosion control. Maybe. Yeah. Euro we model. Uh, I don't have any examples with me, but we model um, our excavation, and we model our uh, underground utilities, and we model our shoring, and so uh, and we've done we've done a lot of work with uh, unsuitable soils. We take the soil report boring logs and we, we model them on our site and where the soil types change we, we make marks and then we connect. Uh, I talked about how a line is two points so we draw a line in between those two boring logs you know where the soils change 
and then I talked about how two lines make a surface. Yeah. We actually create surfaces, and then we can measure volumes between the surfaces and get our soil quantities. We did the bright water wastewater treatment plant out in Woodville, and we did that a lot. We were modeling soil volumes all the time using those kinds of techniques. Yeah. Did you do that in Revit or Civil 3D? That was in Civil 3D. Okay. Is there a way to bring a civil 3D surface into Navis Works? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. In fact, I mean the, that model, I, the, the, the sound transit model, is a SketchUp surface, but we got that off Google Earth, so we can take Google Earth terrain um, surfaces and bring them into civil 3D or bring them into SketchUp and export them into Navis Works. Um, yeah. So we were talking about um, maybe maybe how to build a job, but like a a roadway job or something. That where we have this other project on the about the relation between building model and then the survey um, <coughs> data that yeah. we put in yeah. the, the, the relationship there. And we had a, a survey that wasn't rocket science, but they built the line of lines for our job on the equipment to the water, so they built the population uh, on the water, and so they set the line of lines so that wherever you were, you could to figure out where you were in terms of the project line. Oh, that's cool. Like what your grid offsets are? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's really cool. So down here, this shows your grids. In this building, um, you know, we've got letter grids in one direction and numbered ones in another, in the other, much like you'd see on every building. So this is grid E.25 and, and grid 2.3. So those are your grids. And then the minus is, is like a feet off of the grid. So it's like you're I'm standing right here, maybe the grid's on that wall, it would be four feet, you know, that's what this value would be. It's like I'm that far from the grid. And then this is the level, level one, which is elevation 571. So um, it tells me where I am. And if you look at that, as I navigate around, you can see that it, it changes. You see how it's just measuring me all the time? Yeah. And then I've been going horizontal, and I'm going to go vertical, and my level's going to change. Mm -hmm. So uh, that gives you your wayfinding all the time, right there. And then there's also a few more reference views. Um, I can see my x, y, z axis and my position readout also. So, um, so the x, y, z kind of helps me keep from getting all spun out because like, you can see how it changes as I move up and down. And then the position readout, this is the actual, you know, you, to your point about the survey, uh, this is the actual coordinate in feet, well, feet and inches and, and fractions. Um, and you can set that to decimal of a foot or meters or whatever you want. So we're on what's called state plane coordinates. So uh, each state in the continental United States has a, a zero, 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 that's usually, I mentioned how it's like always north and east of zero, so I think it's down by, um, uh, well, it's across actually in Oregon, out of the Oregon coast, right at the mountain of the Columbia is a zero, zero, zero for Washington. And so every point on the state of Washington is measured off that point. And so Payne Field, Everett is, is 1.2 million feet away in the X and uh, 342,000 feet in the Y away from that point. So we're on state plane coordinates, which is what our civil engineers work on. And so all the points in our model match what our surveyors are using on site and what's tied to the civil drawings. So it's a big number, but it really works well. To, then we have a campus, so if, if we, if right there, uh, if we have another building next to this one, we just keep it all in the same coordinate system and they all match up. You had a question? Uh, what's the fixed point for Z? For Z, it's uh, uh, sea level, average sea level. So we're, we're 500 feet above sea level is what that means. Yeah. I mean, if it has an already mobile pool, is the technology going towards being able to use this out in the field as a mobile Oh, we already we already do. There's a software called Jim 360 that lets us put it on the tablets, and uh, we have uh, the big kiosks on our site, so you can go out to a, it's basically a job box, but there's a screen and a computer in there, 
and we have Wi-Fi connection, so all the models are refreshed to it. And then we have, uh, of course, all of our total stations and survey instruments are loaded in with these coordinates, so uh, everything's tied together now. So I could essentially be out in the field and if we're looking at something and there's going to be a pipe that's going to be running through and you know, we're going to run a duct bank and be able to see, okay, is this pipe going to hit this duct bank and be able to direct the crew right then? Exactly. Um, exactly. What, <clears throat> what about the detail on a certain area? Like if you really wanted to zoom in on detail on something or an uh -huh. item. Uh, well, like uh, when you know, the type of windows. Okay, we want to see a detail on that. <coughs> uh, well, uh, let me unhide everything here. I mean, here, let me have this part. I mean, it's it's. It's only as detailed as the model, oh. and and so usually what happens is it gets modeled kind of crudely. Like this thing is kind of overlapping, and this thing I don't know how you see that. But yeah, they're they're not perfectly modeled because the person who modeled it they didn't really care about that. Might the detail might show that as a miter cut or something, but it's not modeled that way. So you, you have to be a little bit careful when it comes to details because a lot of times the details are not drawn using the model, they're drawn separately. Can you still reference this with a, the old school blueprint way? If, you know, I mean, well, the details would be really hard to do that way, but sometimes what we'll do is we'll take the floor plans that have all the room names and the door swings and all that, and we'll put them in our model uh, and put them just like a half an inch above the floor so that the lines don't get buried inside the concrete. Mm -hmm. And then you know what room you're in and, and all the information that's on that floor plan. Um, we don't usually bring in all the dimensions there, just the line work uh, and, the, and the IDs. Like yeah, the mess up your elevation, right? Well, no, because it's just lines. We, we can filter out of that. We, we don't count it for anything. Or, but it's nice just for kind of orientation. And we do a lot of things with screenshots. So we use this uh, snipping tool. Um, Yeah. And so this snipping tool lets me grab a screen grab, and I can I can draw an arrow on it, that kind of thing. So we can communicate stuff really easily. And when we have the floor plans with the room names, we'll get the view so that you can see the room name and the view, so that when you snip it, it kind of lets you know where you're at. So you snip that. Now that's like a <coughs> note to the to the model. No, it's actually external from the model, so I could just copy that to my clipboard and paste it in an email or something. But if I wanted to, uh, uh, if I wanted to uh, save uh, uh, save a view of it in the model, uh, I have these save viewpoints, and I can right click and I can save a viewpoint, and I could just call something. And now I can be anywhere, and I want to get back to that. I can just go back to there and click on it, and I'm right back to where I used to be. So, and, I, and these are shareable. There's a uh, there's a file type called XML, extensible markup language, and I can right click and I can export my viewpoints, and it creates this XML file. And then I can send that in an email to someone, and they can import that into their model, and then all those views would come right in, and they can click on them and get right to the same place. Did everyone understand what he just said? It's like a review tool. It is like a review tool. And uh, with the views, if I if I click on this, I can the, with my review tool now. I'm showing you Navsworks Manage or Simulate right now, not Navsworks Freedom, okay? I, you can't do what I'm about to do in Freedom, unfortunately. But I can, I can draw, I can draw a circle around it, I can put in text. Um, you know, whatever. And, and that's part of my communication to that view. Now, if I go back and uh, 
the back. How much show. more for that feature, Dale? If you have a yeah, simulate is, yeah, it's a couple grand or something like that. Well, the one you said, uh, Yeah, well, manage is the expensive one, but simulate would do that same thing. It's about half price of manage. Oh. About 28, I, I can't remember, we don't buy that one, so I don't remember the price of it. It's like 3,000 or less, yeah. Um, is all of this material actually being stored and rendered centrally and then you're just accessing it online or do you actually have with you all of this content in a portable file of some sort? Yes. Um, I'm saying yes oh. because either one would work. The, the, the model could live on a server and I could be accessing it from a server. Uh, this particular one, the models that we're showing you guys are are, print, are saved out as now source document files in WDs, which is how most of the models get communicated. And those are just snapshots in time, so you could replicate that on any um, server anywhere, or on your hard drive, or on your tablet, and everything is right there. But you can't modify it. You cannot mod. Well, you can. You can in that you can add views to it and right. all you that. Can't you can't update your model. Yeah. With, with that, but but you it, like we work <coughs> with the uh, now source manage in the in the, in the in the native format, and all the files are on the server. So the file we work with is actually quite small because it's just a bunch of links to all the other sources. But there you have to be on a good network in order to make it work. So, Dave, on the previous couple of months, we get used to maybe drives that we give us somewhere that we think of all set, but we just go in the freedom and we just kind of have to drive. What we do, but for estimating, we still use the two D times. Well, that is going to change. You would have to, but your your question earlier was if you go to the Builders Exchange and download the files. Now, if Builders Exchange also had a, a model file that you could download, then you could be using the model to be doing your estimate. But they typically don't support yeah. those, right? But so we work we work with. Our design teams during pre-construction, so we share they share their files with us because we give them better estimates and, and much more quickly. Because most of the you know this most of the time in the building an estimate is doing the quantification side, not so much the pricing side. And so you can spend two thirds or three quarters of your time just counting everything up, measuring it all, and building your database of quantities, and then you're just plugging unit prices in. It's you know quantity times unit price equals cost. The pricing can be simple, maybe, because uh, uh, you could have a database of prices that you work with all the time, and you're just keeping those current with inflation and everything. So it doesn't take very long to say, okay, I'm painting, you know, uh, three coats of latex interior paint. I know my price per square foot is X. You're just putting that X in there. That's pretty quick compared to figuring out how many square feet. So if you can use a model, uh, it's not like there's an easy button, but it's almost an easy button once you get everything all mapped properly, which is hard but not impossible. Then the next time you get a, you know, it's really frustrating, I bet, if you just about done with your takeoff and then there's an addendum yes. and you have to go start over. Yeah. I mean, with, with the models, if they gave you a new model, you would just put the new model in and hit calculate. If you mapped everything previously, you would just spit out the numbers. When I have to see when you part of the building, uh, Data that has been written every time I receive. I have a big commercial, very famous buildings, but I always get the. Uh, when I go, yeah, when I go, I go look at it, there's a different story, but you yeah. yeah. always get the two big lines, yeah. never ever a model. Do so you think if I, what is the best, if I learn uh, about uh, architecture, do I need to learn AutoCAD, all those things, that is a is self a program? No, uh, you, you don't even need to you know, learn Revit, in my opinion. If you learn Navisworks and learn the quantification tool in Navisworks, you'd be able to take any um, 3D file that you've got your hands on and put it into Navisworks and you use the same tool for every job over and over and over again. I know, yeah. Well, I mean, this, this is really the meat of what I wanted to present. So I think rather than try and shift gears, we could just keep talking about Navisworks. Because I really think that this is more engaging for people. It's very helpful with the practical knowledge. I yeah. love it. I don't know. How's everyone else doing? Very good. good, good. Please continue. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to 
find out more about what you all, and I've been learning some from some of you. So are, are most of you interested in the estimating side of it, or are there other elements of BIM that you want to be exposed to tonight? Any ideas? It's simply estimating your teaching us now. It's for general contractors dealing with concrete and all other sub trades. And uh, uh, people like us, we use uh, Acubit uh, yes. for electrical and uh, McCormick and some other software. Um, this one is so uh, condensed, you know, having a lot of stuff together. Um, am I uh, in the wrong class? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> but, but actually, you know, and I'll try to take a stab at this and please jump in, uh, Dale. Um, the, the design actually for this class was an introduction, but actually for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, there's a separate uh, separate design uh, program, I believe, separate modules specifically for that environment. And is different BIM software? Isn't, isn't there a model for, for the mechanical electrical? Well, there's only one kind of now works really. Uh, it, it doesn't care what system. There is There are different flavors of Revit, Sure. So there's Revit MEP, mm -hmm. which has more, basically, it's, it's just kind of like them updating their software every year. They could they could have one kind of Revit and it would have all the different libraries in it, all the different stuff, but instead there's Revit Architecture, Revit Structure, and Revit MEP. Um, and the only real difference is that they, they all have different object libraries loaded in. So Revit Architecture has a lot of windows and doors and walls and ceilings. Revit MEP has pipe and duct and you know all the things that are in MEP and Revit structures has beams and concrete and elements and rebar and that kind of stuff. But it's the same software, it just has different libraries uh, loaded in it. So if you you know if they wanted to they could just sell one product but this way they can sell three products. So they're they're thinking they're better off than mm -hmm. clever people. So, but that's really the only difference. Yeah, and some of you may be looking at, at BIM uh, through a review and quality control. Some of you actually may be involved in design build, design assist. Uh, some of you may just have to uh, be able to interpret the drawings because that's where technology is going. Uh, over the next five to 10 years, I believe that you're going to see a lot more three-dimensional drawings than you will see uh, two-dimensional. And it's and you, you haven't seen this yet, but if you just think about the life cycle of a building, and you think about having those kinds of controls available to you in the, the database and the repository, it's a living organism. And this type of technology allows you to be very proactive, whether you're maintaining it, Building it, demolishing it, whatever you're trying to do to that to that building. So while Dan was talking, I um, I basically unhit everything and then hit everything except for the electrical system. And our electrical models have a lot to them. Like all these ghosty things you see here are clearances. Like you have to have clearance in front of an electrical panel for code. But I can come into my sets now and I get my mouse over there. And I've got a I've got a uh, search set for clearances, and I can hide those. And now I'm seeing my electrical panels, and you know even the panel number is on here. So uh, if, like Dan said, if I'm the facilities person and I need to go to a particular panel and flip breaker number 21, I could have this on my tab tablet. And I could search for that panel ID, and it would take me right to that place in the model. And I could walk up to it. And it looks just like the model. Looks like the field. And I've got I've got my my certainty that I've got the right panel that way. Talking about transparency. Can you transparent the door, and this could break on the inside, or do you have to make that an animation thing and open the door to the um, inside. Well, I can. Um, it would be model, probably. See here, I've got this is now sort of. Manage so I can unpolarize transparency and make it um, transparent. But the thing is, is that 
Um, it'd be easier would just be to hide the door, but there's nothing inside this. Gotcha, you'd have to be all there. Yeah, but I've seen in, in vertically integrated industries like the petrochemical industry, nuclear industry, where you know they 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 soup to nuts. They want to use the model for everything, including operating. They use the model to shut down valves or to put breakers. Uh, and there they would have the interior of that model, I guarantee it, and they would know, you could trace a circuit with their, with their system. You could click on circuit number 27 and, and select everything associated with that circuit for that panel, and you could trace all the wires back to the device that it controls. But it's a lot of work to have all that in there, but it's totally worth it to those people because they use it over and over and over and over. There's people um, actually sometimes who think, use this the program they actually go to the job and then you know i mean in a perfect world what i mean what if something's not there that is on there but is it on the job site has that happened i've heard of that happening <laughs> <laughs> but then i mean that's, that's common uh, the the challenge is to get people it, this is a new thing for a lot of people and um Getting them to follow the plan is pretty hard sometimes. There's a tendency for people to solve problems when, as they encounter them. And you know, they they might not always see the whole picture when they're installing something. So we really want people to build it through the model. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Uh, and uh, when as soon, that's why I use that term model atrophy, is when when people start, you know, going away from the plan. It's really hard to get the model to get updated to what's out there. That's why we use laser scanning a lot because sometimes it's easier to just fill in a laser scan and see what you have than it is to try and you know go out there and field measure with a tape measure and write it all down and go back to the computer and make the changes. Fred, Fred actually uh, had to, to leave, but he had a question as it related to scaling. Yes. Um, so, for instance, like the distance between the two panels. So yeah. Okay, let's go over that. And I apologize for using the NASWorks Manage software, but I'm just a lot more familiar with it. And I've got a much richer model with this Boeing project than the Sound Transit one. So, let's say that I want to know the distance between these two panels. So, I click on one. It can, can you see that it got yellow yes. highlight mm -hmm. there? And then, uh, you guys know about. It's a Windows keystroke of control and click, or shift and click. You know how it does a like you can shift click a range of files and it, it grabs the first one and the last one and all the ones in between. Right. Control click just lets you sort of cherry pick the file names. So, like hold down control, you can pick this one, then that one, then this one, then this one. So I'm going to control click. So hold down control and then click on this panel. Okay. So now I've selected this one and this one, and then under review, I can say. I can say shortest distance. Because I've selected um, the two, I can use shortest distance. And I just uh, click on that, and it tells me that it's 3 foot 1 and 3 quarters inches between the two. Now, um, if, I, if I only clicked on one, and I tried shortest distance, see how it's grayed out? Because I don't have two things selected. So it, it couldn't complete that command because I need to select something else. What if you got something that's not plumb? Can you do longest distance as well? No, uh, but let's say uh, I've got this door swing over here and I want to know how much clearance there is between um, my panel and let's say I'll choose that piece of red strut so I can uh, select the strut and select that door and do shortest distance and it's going to figure out wherever the, sh the shortest one is, okay, even though it's a curved surface. So you have a control and control click lets me, I click on one, and then I hold down the control key and click on another. Oh. And that's how I can select two things. Yeah. So it's showing that door as a wedge because it's incorporated the swing into it? Yeah, yeah, and, and the reason we do that is because if we, like you can, that door is swung open, okay? And on the architect's drawings, it'll usually show it that way, okay? But um, I want to know all the locations that that door could exist, not just when it's fully open. Because I don't ever want a pipe to run down through there, like the sprinkler pipe that runs vertically. If they put it in, in front of that door, 
But he wasn't hitting that door. My class detective would never find it, but sure as, sure as anything, I wouldn't be able to close the door, right? And the same is true with valve handles. We, we model them full sweep with valve handles so that nothing could ever take up that space. And so, and, and these are, uh, uh, these are clearances. So it's, it's just as important to, um, to have these clearances like these are all required clearances in front of the electrical panels. And that door sweep is all is grabbing all the space that, that door can possibly take up. It's really important that all that is in the model. Even though it doesn't physically represent anything, it represents the possible outcome. And we always control for that so that nothing ever gets in front of there. So um, that lets now there's another way that I can I can dimension. Um, I can just say I'm just going to measure, so I'm going to measure from there to there, okay? So I don't have to select two things and do closest distance. I can just use my measure tool, uh, but sometimes it, you can get kind of a strange result because it, I'm not positive I got it right on the corner there, okay? If I really wanted to know what the narrowest distance is, that shortest distance is a really good tool. So it's going to snap there. There, there aren't very many good snaps in Navis work. I can, I can do some things like, I'll clear this, there's this lock function, so I can, I, can, I can start my measure tool up, I can grab this corner, and then I can lock perpendicular to that. Um, there we go. Now, because I, I locked perpendicular, I'm going to be just in, you, you might recall that when I did it on the diagonal, I got the triangle part. There's no triangle here, right? Because I'm perpendicular to the, I'm on a north-south line here. Yeah, so there are some things I can do, but really not very much. Can you change the scale if you find that you're, you know, on site, that you have a slightly different dimension? Can, that, can you actually go in and modify the model? Yes, uh, so down here, I'm seeing the relative elements. So x is 0, y is 12 foot, 11 is 7 eighths, and z is 0. So this is all in the y. So OK, so let's say that it was supposed to be 12, 11, and 7 eighths, and I get out there, and it's 12 foot, 8 and 7 eighths. OK, so my y is actually 3 inches shorter than this. So I can, uh, I can come in here, and this is, again, Unfortunately, not with freedom. So I could, right. I can come in here, and I can override, transform, and I can put a, a minus minus three inches right there. Okay. And move it. Okay. So I can move things in Navisort, but the danger is that. If somebody republishes the model that that's in, and then I get it. Um, I don't know if they've moved it too, or I have moved it. It'll, it'll remember that transform, so the next time I bring in the new model, refresh, it will transform it again. Sure. So if somebody also <coughs> moved it, then it'll get moved twice. Okay. So there's a danger in doing this. But we don't just so get a hierarchy of who has control of Yeah. And we usually do it for what if. So if we've got a clash, where we use it mostly is if there's a clash here and we think that moving it three inches is going to clear the clash, we'll move it like if it's a pipe sure. and we lower it down three inches and then we can run the clash patch again and see that it made sense. Uh, and then it didn't cause a domino effect on something else we're not thinking about. That's how we use that. You know, because it's, it's not really an authoring tool. With that, by that I mean it's not a tool for building objects. It's a tool for them. Yeah. So that little move you made there actually is in the hygiene of managing the files. A better way to do it that then wouldn't risk replication or error? And what would that be? Uh, the better way to do it is to change it in the source model. The, the, in this case, the Revit model that, that built this in the first place. is to make, We've tried to make all of our changes in the source model and then resubmit them and then the BIM coordinator brings them, refreshes the files. See, in this, in this project, um, um, 
this this is I'll show you how many files there are. So and then we have it all. So I, I mentioned that, that file names matter. So these these are all of our file names. So these are all the files that people have built um, for this building, the lots. And that's just the construction model files for the most part. These all end in a CM. You see here CM, that's construction model. That's Sequoia Electric, Shin Mechanical, Vector, Becca Electric. I talked about the baby kitchen or baby. Uh, birds on the rookery, right? They all look the same to you and I, but if you're the mom, you know which one's yours, and I'm the mom of all these files. <laughs> and so, you know, WW Steel, Structural Steel, Autoclave Level, Boeing 4058. So, you know, all this stuff matters to me. If we had done anything random, I wouldn't be able to know all that just by looking at these. You know, these aren't license plate numbers, these are actual, these go to dictionaries, you know. Uh, electrical branch equipment, uh, electrical power equipment, you know, points of connection, mechanical drive, ductwork. I mean, those are all actual definitive codes that we use. And then my search sets that I showed you all leverage that quite effectively to be able to filter it really quickly. So this is all we program, right? Is it the market or is there are some other programs like those? There's one called uh, Celebri that's a competitor to Navisworks. It's really common in Europe, not so common in the US. And it's, it's similar. Um, I didn't really run out of time, but I didn't really show you clash detection. Uh, but they both do clash detection. Um, Celebri is a little bit better at those at making rules. Like you could say that um, 42 inches in front of an electrical panel you know, it has to be a clearance zone and not actually have to model a clearance zone in front of the panel. Whereas we would just model the clearance zone, but it, I think it's best practice to model it anyway, not depend on a rule that could be buried in some code somewhere. But so Solibri and NowSearch are really the only two that I know of that do this kind of work. How long would it take for you to do a class detection? Well, um, not I, I think it would be useful. Um, I have to find it. Let <laughs> um, me close some of this stuff. I think this stuff is on top of everything. So it's plus detection for use for the model than the contractor probably. The contractor is using them all the time. Um, uh, I think there it is. Okay. Okay. And one thing I didn't really explain to you is, is the way uh, that the, everything docks. What's going on is the projectors cropping, and that's why I couldn't see it. So when you dock um, all your windows, they all kind of land along the outside. Like there's find items and measure tools and save viewpoints and properties and clash detective. Um, if you if you just want to look at something and then get rid of it. It just goes away and you click away. But if you want it there, there's this little push pin here. And um, if you click on it, it locks, it locks it. Let me, uh, yeah. um, another thing that I wanted to show you is, is the way it docks. Is you can, you really want to get a good size monitor to kind of work with NASWORKS a lot because having this little real estate is, it feels really claustrophobic. But when I when I drag this window, you'll see these two little tiny boxes everywhere. That's how I can dock. Like if I say I want this clash detector to be over on the left side, I can drag it until it goes like that and then let go. And now it's pinned and docked. And what that does is uh, is it, it kind of shortens up my my window and centers it in what's left on my screen. It's actually pretty clever. Um, and so this is my clash patch. And so I'm um, I'm working with with all these clashes. So basically, what I did I showed you those sets I made. 
So I have a set for each one of my subcontractors, like mechanical dry and mechanical wet and plumbing and electrical and steel. And, um, and then I have a set for architectural walls and structural concrete. And so this batch is looking for mechanical dry, which is ductwork against walls and concrete. And then this is looking for ductwork against ceiling grid. So I'm looking for places like that, where my diffuser is landing in my grid. And I want to find places where it's actually halfway off the grid, so that's a clash. And then I can look at duct against steel and duct against itself. Sometimes people will clash against themselves and I want to be able to find those. And then, then after I get done with the duct, then, uh, then I go to mechanical wet, the same thing. Uh, mechanical wet against architectural walls, against ceiling grid, against steel, mechanical wet against itself, and then mechanical wet against duct. I add a new class to it so that I'm looking at wet against duct. And then I go for plumbing against walls, grid, steel, plumbing against itself, and then against duct, and then against wet. So every time I'm adding one more to the matrix. And so by the time I'm done, I get down to um, sprinkler, MFS, electrical. I've got two electrical subs, so electrical Becca, electrical Sequoia, and that's my batch. So by the time I'm done, I've clashed everything against everything, but I've done it very deliberately in these different groups. So if I've got my plumber and my electrician on the phone, I can look at just the clashes between the two of them and we can go through and adjudicate those together. And you can set code for how far, you know, uh, yes. high voltage and low voltage can be away from water or whatnot. And that could also be a part of that class detection. Yeah, so, so here is, I'm selecting, so there's left and a right. So I'm clashing one thing against another thing, or a group of things against another group of things. So I'm selecting um, Sequoia Electric against Hoppy Mechanical Plumbing. Okay, so it's two different subs. And here I'm saying it's a hard clash, which means they actually have to be touching. And I could have uh, made this a clearance clash. Um, and if I set clearance, then I can say I want it to be two inches. So that would mean I want to find everything that's within two inches of the other thing. Um, so if you wanted to wrap it or something like that. Yeah, right. It is, a lot of times we'll do it with steel. So if we're clashing in structural steel, this particular job, there's no fireproofing. Uh, but typically there would be. Uh, like if you have a steel building with more than one floor, the floor decks are usually fireproof. Sure. It's very rare that anybody would model fireproofing. So if we do a duct against steel, we'll do a two inch clearance clash for that one because we always want to be two inches away from the steel so that the fireproofing doesn't have to get scraped. So we can, each one of these has its own set of rules. Is that what you guys did? The word structural missing is steel. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, you guys wouldn't fireproof. Yeah. No. And then and then here's where I look at my results. And and again it's really awkward to do this with a tiny screen. Normally I have two monitors and my class box is in one side and my models in the other. But what what happens is they all come in as these individual clashes and then um, I need to uh, to group them. Few. And then I can group them and um, yeah, it's really hard to just to demonstrate this with such a small amount of the work with. But I can hide under hide under and focus on clash. And and there's there's all my clashes. So these are all places where There you can see I've got a pipe and a duck hitting each other. And so somebody's got to be a certain amount and I can I can look at this is really hard to see what I'm doing here. But over well, over on the right is is 
where it went through this. There we go. So it tells me my grid intersection and the date and time I found. And way over on the right is the distance. That's what I was looking for. So that tells me how big the overlap is. So five and a half inches in that case. You know. So I have to move one of those things six inches to get it safely to clear away. So that's how I can learn from this. And again, if you had a regular size monitor, they're cheap now, right? I mean, for 150 bucks or something, you can get a really nice quality big monitor, and then you'll you'll really be better off having enough real estate. You know, doing it with a low res of the projector is not as good, but it's a really powerful tool. You can see I have my work cut out for me. I've got 1,500 clashes to resolve there, and so it's it's a lot of work to do. It's been, well, this is a giant building, you know, million square foot factory, so. Uh, you know, normally you wouldn't have nearly that many. Like that seven transit project probably only has a hundred clashes in it right now. But that's clash day. And being a BIM coordinator, this is really the world you live in. It's working all those models and finding all the problems. Every time we can solve a problem now before it gets into the parks and into the field, think of the savings. You know, there's so much inefficiency in our industry that we could be shaking out by using these tools to where it's more like we're assembling the building than building it, you know. We want it to be more like a manufacturing process where the parts come out, they fit, they're made in high quality, so the workers can put them together really quickly and sure, and sure, you know, it's for quality and safety and they're moving on to the next thing. They're not doing it twice. They're not standing around going, hey, you know, you got peanut butter in my chocolate. And the other one says, nope, you got chocolate in my peanut butter, you know. They just have those big battles and really, we should get it all figured out ahead of time. We're pretty much at closing time, right? Are there any questions or comments? Well, um, on the clashing, so basically, like you said, you eliminate that. So when we go out there, so if I had uh, uh, these, not these future, but say the HVAC box is not in the right spot where I can have 30 inch clearance, which is mandatory for a high removable grid. And I can see all that just by the print and not go on to the job site. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, I mean, when you were doing your grid install, I bet you ran into it all the time. Mm -hmm. Somebody's poking down right where your grid goes. Yeah. Okay. And you know, this would eliminate that, definitely. As long as they put it in for the model, you know, that's a whole other challenge to get people to put it in for the model, right? But at least, you know, if you, yeah, under our scenario with the IFF approval, if you submitted your grid to us in your model, we would check it against the contract documents, we'd make sure it was all good to go, and we would give you your IFF approval. And then when you go out there, you're still maybe going to have things in your way, but there'd be no dispute. If you put it in for your IFF file, the other guy's going to move. No, no, no need for RFIs. Yeah, that's right. So one thing I wanted to show you, we talked a little bit about the 4D, um, which is tying a schedule to a model. And I had a couple of uh, videos that I wanted to show. Uh, so this is, a, this is a semiconductor factory where we had to put these big racks in. And we, we figured out all the parts and pieces. We got it all clash free. And then we figured out our installation sequence and we showed this to our bidders to show them what the sequence is. And then this is another example. This is a bigger project. And this one, uh, there's a lot of big duct and a lot of big pipe. You can start seeing it going in. And it's so big that we, if we would have just let the structure go up all the way up, we, would, we wouldn't be able to get all that stuff in because you needed the crane in order to pick it and set it. And so. Uh, we did this sequence, so it's not just steel erection, but it's steel erection plus equipment plus big duct and big pipe, all going in in a big choreographed sequence. And we built these 4Ds to show um, to show our crews what our plan was to to uh, to get all this built. These are these are this is like eight foot diameter pipe, that blue pipe right there. And and so these these were really valuable tools for us. One of the things that the iron workers were concerned about is, you know, they all they're all about their hook time. They want they want to own that crane and put their units up and we had we don't have our cranes on this model, but we had two cranes and we were able to show them that 
you work in these zones and then you flip and work in these and while you're working over here the duct and pipe is going in over here and we did it so that uh, there's never any downtime for the crews they're all working all the time and we got good buy-in and this went into our bid packages so everybody saw our plan they could they could plan for it and it goes pretty fast but you can stop this anywhere you want and it tells you what, what date you're on right there. So you can see any day of the job, you can see what's going on there. I'm just bring out my spreadsheet. Well, the schedule would, but this this is a this is an ADI video file. But right, but I mean the, the schedule would. Yeah, the schedule, yeah, yeah we, we gave them Gantt charts and tabular reports also, but this is what people really want. They really want to see how their work works in concert with other people's and where they're going to go on a given day and everything else. You're, they're utilizing all this with uh, interior decorators all the way to real estate and all that. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. The more we can get into our models, the better. That's why we do the shoring, we do the tiebacks, we do the utilities, we do the grades, we do the soil. Wow. We do everything we can inside. What we don't usually get to would be the room finishes, like carpet and paint and wall covers. Cause those, you know, they're, nobody's modeling them. They're not really 3D they're, or 2D, and we don't usually get those. Do you have an example of what I think? I do not, no. Um, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I knew I was going to run out of time. I didn't think I was going to run out of time like I did, but, um, but I, didn't, I didn't bring it.